Hebrews chapter 3. Last Sunday we spent uh, the entire time dwelling on verse 6, and we left verse 6 last time with the conclusion that the words, the end, hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, mean the end of the tribulation which is to come. That man or woman who is, who is even called a partaker of Christ, later in verse 14, can still lose their salvation if they don't hold fast firm unto the end. In fact, before we go any further, keep your finger here and run forward to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. And uh, let's, read a, let's read a few verses there, starting at verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Look back at chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, as we said before, during the tribulation, salvation will no longer be by grace through faith with, without uh, works, apart from anything else. Grace through faith alone. It will be a, a strange combination of faith in Jesus Christ, after having just come through the church age for 2,000 years prior, and obedience to the commandments God gave to the Jews. How are those things going to be fully coupled together? I'm not sure. I and mean, I don't know if anyone is. Because I'm not planning to be here for one thing. Amen. And uh, the other is, I'm not waiting to pass some future test to make sure I don't take the mark of the beast in order to be saved. Right. I'm saved now. Yeah. Amen. My name is already in the, is in the Lamb's Book of Life, and it's already there in permanent ink and can never be erased. And so I don't have to pass some future test to show my loyalty uh, in order to make sure of my salvation. I'm saved right now. Uh, Ephesians 2.6 says that God had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. And how do you get into Christ Jesus? Very simple. Ask Christ Jesus to come into you. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you, Jesus said in the Gospel of John. So you get into the body of Jesus Christ, you become part of his church, part of his bride, by asking him to come live in you, by the new birth, by salvation, and being born again. All right, let's go to Hebrews uh, 3, and let's continue reading verse 7, down through the end of the chapter. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts, in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, 
if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Whilst it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. As if to dispel any doubts uh, about the context of verse 6, the writer here, who we believe is Paul, he continues with an Old Testament illustration of people under a covenant of works, not salvation by grace. John 1, 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, uh, who endured hardship for a period of time, not simply the lifetime of the individual believer, um, and uh, in order to reach the promised land of Canaan. That's a great type of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ following the tribulation just before it. I want you to run back to the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. I'll give you a moment to find it. It's a small minor prophet. Hosea and chapter 2, I think. Hosea 2. Hosea 2, let's begin there at verse um, 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her, and I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So he's talking about the Israelites. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, which means uh, husband, and shalt call me no more Baali, which is a, a word for Lord. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee to me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Um, if you read Psalm 78 sometime, it's a lengthy psalm, I read that at, on your own time, but he recalls the, the journeys of Israel in the wilderness, their rebellion, God's protection, God's deliverance and provision for them, and uh, God sustaining them in the desert for, for 40 years. And uh, you'll see that the events that happened to Israel once upon a time when they wandered for 40 years are going to happen again under the man of sin when he turns on them and begins to pursue them and hunt them down. Um, verse 7 in our text here says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, saith today if he will hear his voice, thus uh, showing that we're dealing with a certain period of time today, not uh, the lifetime of the believer from the moment he's saved until the moment he uh, dies. Um, let me have you go back to a couple of places, 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I don't apologize for having you turn back and forth as much as we do because this is how the Bible is to be understood, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, and then let the Scriptures interpret themselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 
uh, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy 9. And um, just verse 1 is enough. Here Moses says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. The expressions today, uh, this day, and now, in those passages, uh, meant a, a limited window of opportunity to obey God, to comply, to succeed, and receive God's blessing. He just says, don't miss it. Now's the time. You know, you're not always going to have someone care about your soul. There's going to come a time when nobody else will, will care about you at all. If you don't get saved, um, when the opportunity is given to you, the time will come and nobody's going to pass out a track to you. Nobody's going to witness to you. You'll be uh, 90 years old or 95 years old, if you live that long, in a nursing home. And people out of sight, out of mind, they will have forgotten all about you. You might still have faculties to think and reason with, but nobody's going to witness to you once you get to that stage. It's just the way life goes, unfortunately. You better get saved when someone's pleading with you, when they're making an appeal to you to trust Jesus Christ how, and, and show you how simple it is to be born again without trusting your own works or effort. Get saved while the opportunity is presented to you. The, 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 the best and the easiest time to be born again, to be saved for all of eternity is right now. Yes. Amen. Because it's salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. There's not a thing I can do or need to do in order to secure my salvation or to anchor it down, to nail it down, to be certain of it. Christ Jesus did it all for me. Amen. He does the saving. All I can do is the trusting. That's about all it comes down to. Calvinists wrestle with this. They never could figure it out. <clears throat> Um, Augustus Toplady, he wrote, uh, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And um, he was a diehard Calvinist and believed that God had to choose, God had to elect the sinner and decide who he would save and who he would not save. And so in the lyrics he says, Could my uh, tears forever flow, could my zeal no languor know, thou must save and thou alone. All these for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And he believed that God had to choose the sinner to get saved. That um, there was no free will on the part of the, the uh, sinner who needed to be born again. Thankfully, God kept that hymn around, and the Calvinistic interpretation fell by the wayside, and we get a great blessing out of it. Because he was right in this respect. There's nothing I could do. I couldn't cry and boo-hoo and bawl my way to salvation. All I could do was trust what Jesus Christ did. He says, in my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I talked about the Hamite preachers. Yesterday I heard a black preacher, my job, uh, telling his church members, it is, it is, salvation has nothing to do with you. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't matter how many times you've gone to Bible study, doesn't matter how many times you've gone to church. But do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And I, I thanked him later on. I said, I appreciate what you said. I said, you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter how many times you've gone to Bible class or how many times you've gone to, to church. But it's how many times have you been to Calvary? Amen. And in that respect, only one time is necessary. Amen. All right? Thank you, Lord. Thank the Lord for that. But um, don't miss the opportunity to be saved when it's offered to you when it's presented to you in this day and age. Verse 8. Let's read that verse again back in our text. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Um, the reference is clearly to the Hebrews provoking 
the Lord to anger by their rebellion, by their stubbornness, by being obstinate and disobedient, and provoking Moses to rebuke them for it in no uncertain terms. Psalm 106, verse 33 says about Moses, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly to them. And in our text, the word today is defined as the day, which lasted for 40 years, there in verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Verse 10 says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. That generation that was forced to wander in the wilderness 40 years, none of them but Caleb and Joshua, not Caleb and Joshua Park, but the other Caleb and Joshua in the, in the Old Testament, uh, only those two got into uh, the land of Canaan, at least none uh, over the age of 20 who took the side of the rebellious spies. Remember when uh, Moses sent in uh, 12 spies to spy out the land of Canaan? They left Egypt and uh, crossed the Red Sea, and then they ventured from uh, the other side of Sinai uh, straight up to the land of Canaan, and then he sent a spy, one from each one of the 12, 12 tribes, to go in and search out the land and like a reconnoiter, come back and report uh, what they saw and assess the land. And they came back and Caleb and Joshua gave a good report. The land flows with milk and honey and uh, so forth. But the other 10 spies said, we can't, we can't, we don't dare go in there. The land is filled with giants, the sons of the Anakims, a people who are great and tall and their cities are walled up to heaven. And they were, uh, we were as grasshoppers in their sight. That's how giant and uh, ginormous they are. Uh, and they're going to step on us if we try to do battle with them. But you know, Joshua and Caleb took a different view. They said, you know, if God has led us this far, he'll make a way for us to have victory. Mm. But because the multitude, and the multitude, of course, uh, listen to the ten spies who were bad-mouthing it and discouraging them, dissuading them. They listened to them rather than the two that said, God will be with us. And therefore God said, all right, uh, out you go. You're going to wander around the wilderness until all those people who doubt me are dead and gone. And, uh, of course, they tried to make one feeble attempt. Let's try it again. Maybe we can. They went in and got their rear ends kicked and uh, had to flee back out and they ended up wandering because God wasn't in it that time. God wasn't leading them. They, they missed the opportunity to go in when they were first there. So they wandered around the wilderness uh, for the next 40 years until that entire generation of people who rebelled at Kadesh Barnea were dead. So, so the rebellion <clears throat> of that multitude took place before the 40-year count even began, before the 40 years wandering even started. There was an entire multitude of Jews who uh, sided with the complainers and the doubters and the skeptics, and God said, oh, I'm going to let you wander around until you all die out here in the wilderness, and not a one of you is going to see the promised land. And of course, it took 40 years for that generation to die. I have a book at home called uh, The History of, I think it's called The History of the Jews, or a, sur or a survey of Israel's history. And the author, I think his last name is Wood, he speculated that <clears throat> based upon the amount of people that left Egypt, as best as they can figure, that left Egypt with Moses, wandering around for 40 years, that the Jews were losing 70 people a day. 70 people a day would die for the next 40 years until that entire generation they, they estimate uh, at least close to 2 million Jews left Israel under Moses' leadership. And uh, talk about a multitude that. 2 million people. You seen those pictures where there's the, you know, the steps of the Capitol when the president's being sworn in. They've got this sea of people, and they speculate, the, the, the D.C. Parks Department, and they speculate that maybe a million people had gathered there either for... President Obama, maybe President Trump, I don't know how many gathered there. 
but they expect to get a million people. You see that sea of people. It's like as far as you can see, nothing but people. Well, double that. I think you could fill up Dodger Stadium something like 20 times to come to that, class, that uh, number of people. All of them following one man and his authority. He was the visible authority of God on the earth at the time. And uh, when the spies came back and complained, the multitude uh, sided with them and didn't want to trust God to take them in. So for the next 40 years, if this author's calculation was correct, they were losing an average of 70 people, 70 deaths per day for the next 40 years. <clears throat> And, of course, having children along the way uh, with, in, in route so that the younger generation grew up and um, survived. And they, did, they knew nothing about the rebellion. They knew nothing about the, the uh, unbelief of their parents until their parents and grandparents were dead. And they <clears throat> came of age and entered into the promised land with Joshua and Caleb. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, verse 11 records God saying, they shall not enter into my rest. There is no spiritual reference to a believer resting from his own works and, and trusting in the work of Jesus Christ alone. I mentioned here, there's no reference to New Testament salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. The rest here was to the literal, physical visible rest of the literal physical 12 tribes of Israel once they uh, reach the promised land. Um, go back for a moment to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> Acts 13 this is what Paul's words to the Jews are here in verses 38 and 39. Acts 13, verses 38 and 39. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified, by the law of Moses. But there's none of that being mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 12 then in our text warns, take heed, brethren. So he says to the Jews, he calls them brethren in Acts 13. So when he says here, take heed, brethren, he's talking to Jews. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. If you understand that the word rest in this section, um, rather understand the word and take it to mean um, eternal rest when you get to heaven, then it's easy to think that, well, there must be something I must do to make sure I don't lose my salvation. It's easy to think that you're in danger of losing it if you fall away or if you don't hold out steadfast to the end. That maybe there's something I need to do to secure it, to make sure I don't lose it. It can't be taken away from me. As if you interpret the word rest to mean eternal rest, like rest in peace, right? Uh, on your gravestone. But that's not the rest he's got in mind. That is, that is to misunderstand the word rest. I, I should have said misunderstand the word rest. And um, this is why so many people who may be born again, they may be saved, but they're not careful students of the Word of God. They're not taught or exposed to rightly dividing the Word of Truth and figure out whether that text is intended for somebody else or if it's intended for me to take literally. And uh, therefore, the Bible becomes a very tricky book if you don't learn to rightly divide the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15 <coughs> tells us to do. And you can come away thinking that well, there are, there are certain verses which suggest a Christian can lose his salvation. And then there are others which suggest that he cannot lose his salvation. So which ones are right? <clears throat> well, just to be on the safe side, I guess the uh, way in the flesh says, well, I better follow those verses that suggest I can lose it. And therefore, I better get busy to do all these good things that will gain me uh, extra favor with God. 
to uh, hopefully keep him from denying my salvation to me. Uh, go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3, and um, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy which temple ye are. This, these two verses have been misinterpreted by the Pentecostal brethren to think that if you commit suicide, you automatically lose your salvation. That's not what the verses say at all. It says, if any man defile the temple of God, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives inside of you from the moment you get saved. And he says, if any man defile the temple of God. You know, you go out there and mess around with dope and fornicate and be a pervert and uh, do everything else that satisfies the flesh and have no time for God. Don't put it past God to kill you early to keep you from doing any, any more damage to the cause of Christ. That's about all it comes down to. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So if you're, your body is said to be holy because of an separated by the saving work of the Holy Spirit. You're to keep it that way, live that way, behave that way, conduct yourself that way. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Well, it can't be suicide because if you've already committed suicide, God can't, has nothing left to destroy. So it has to be something else. It has to be um, disgracing the Lord Jesus Christ by your own conduct. You say, I'm a Christian, yet you're out there doing everything else perverted, uh, along with your unsaved friends at work or at school, whatever the case may be. And uh, you're living like an unsaved guy. You're living like the devil. Then don't put it past God to bring your life to a premature end to keep you from doing any more damage to the cause of Christ. He doesn't need your, your um, uh, disgracefulness and your embarrassment uh, in this life. He's got enough problems, enough obstacles getting in the way to, keep, to get the gospel out. <laughs> The last thing he needs is a rebellious Christian who wants to live like all of his unsaved friends live. And also, look at 1 Corinthians 5. This is part of the marvelous blessing of eternal security. Eternal security. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Same book of the Bible. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. There is some guy in their local assembly was shacking up with either his mother or his stepmother. And Paul says, the, the Gentiles don't do that stuff. They've got better sense than that. And who are you, uh, a Christian? Of course, Gentiles. Of course, these Corinthians were Gentiles. But he's making, drawing a distinction between saved ones and unsaved ones. He says the, the, the unsaved people don't live that way. They don't, they've got enough sense not to do that. They know certain things by, by nature. Certain things are right and wrong. You shouldn't do that. Yet some guy in their assembly among their believers was doing that. Notice what he recommends in verse, seven, verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know, it doesn't get much worse than a guy who's fornicating with his own mother, or stepmother, as the case may be. The Bible's not uh, clear in verse 1 there. It doesn't get much worse than that. Here's a guy shocked up with his, his, with his mother, or stepmother, and he still doesn't lose his salvation. Now, I guess that's the main point I want you to take away from him. He still doesn't lose his salvation, but Paul says, deliver him unto the Lord for the destruction of the flesh. Remember he said in chapter 3, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So, destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So while a guy might be committing the worst vulgar sins, 
you could think of, he still doesn't lose his salvation. That is eternal security. Wow. Think Praise about that. Lord. And then you read in 2 Corinthians, I think, chapter 2, how this guy did repent, and he got right with God, and then Paul says to receive him back into, right. into fellowship again. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that, and yet the guy still didn't lose his salvation. Hard to, hard to imagine. Bill Clinton said he was saved. He claims he got saved at the Billy Graham crusade when Billy Graham was preaching in Arkansas many years ago. But Bill Clinton, Slick Willie, as they call him, uh, I forget, I think it was George Will, who wrote in one of his columns that Bill Clinton has never had non-political thought. Everything that runs through his mind uh, it has to do with how is it going to make me look politically in the eyes of the public. And if it looks good to pretend you're a Christian, you got saved, and stand there with a hymn book on the Billy Graham platform, singing out loud as the governor of Arkansas, make everybody think you're one of them, you're going to win votes that way, then that's what he needed to do. That's what he did. But nothing else in his life would indicate he's ever been born again or has any concept of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And Hillary, hmm. she said she was raised uh, in a United Methodist Church. She's on her way to hell, too. It's just the, 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 the depths of dishonesty that politicians sink to to try to court favor and win favor and, and, and win votes by the public is just despicable. It really is. That's why, uh, in a way, President Trump is a breath of fresh air. He didn't come into office claiming to have been born again and saved. He came in, you know, with all of his foibles and all the things uh, exposed publicly about him. I, I am who I am, but I got some good ideas for this country. And he said what people have been thinking for years. He, he said what other, other, other politicians promised to do, but never followed through. For some reason, this guy was a real guy. You know, while, while President Trump was building a um, financial empire, building hotels and covering the skyline of Manhattan and New York City, uh, Obama was political, uh, was a uh, uh, community organizing. You know, these guys had never had a regular job. That's Obama. By the way, that was Al Gore. That was even George W. Bush. These guys had never swept a warehouse floor or drove a delivery truck in their lives. They were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Obama, he had the extra benefit because he had dark skin. See, he didn't have to work. He was black. Just open doors for the guy. He can read a teleprompter. How many of you ever saw that picture of Obama giving a speech inside an elementary school? And they're in the, the, the public school library. He's, gathered, he's got students gathered all around him. He's standing behind the, they got the, the uh, POTUS, uh, podium there in the public library. And he's got teleprompters in front of him. He's addressing a group of, of kindergartners and third graders. And he still needs a teleprompter. The guy can't speak his way out of a paper bag. At least he knew there were 58 states in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. He, he counted them all up, 58 states in the United States. He'd been to, and he'd been to all of them. <laughs> you remember that um, there, there, when during the I'm, I'm, I know I'm digressing from the main road. We'll get back on the main highway in a minute. But remember when the, this issue came up about his birth certificate? Trump raised it, but others raised it as well. And Sheriff Arpaio over in Arizona, he had criminal investigators looking over that so-called birth certificate that was released online, he said, they debunked that thing, just a fraud. Right. These guys could tell it was a fraud and a fake, but the news media wasn't going to follow up on it. They just let it slide, let it slide, what's done is done, he's in the office now, just let it go. But, um, <clears throat> and then suddenly he had to make a trip to Hawaii with his family. During that same time that was in the news, and I don't know if it was to... Uh, Either his mother was sick or mother died or somebody died. And I wondered if he's not going back there to fix his birth certificate issue rather than it was convenient because it was convenient that somebody died, it gave him a chance to go to back to Hawaii and fix his birth certificate issue. 
but the, the depths these people sink to to deceive the public is is deplorable and uh, so so as brother Eubank said in his prayer request letter or his prayer letter yeah thank God for the president we have right now with all of his flaws and faults. remember Abraham Lincoln was posing for a portrait <coughs> before they had cameras the guy was painting him and Abraham Lincoln had a big uh, wart on his face and the, the, the painter was not sure how he should turn the president so that wasn't visible and uh, Lincoln said to just paint me as I am warts and all so we have a president warts and all who uh, is turning out to be a rather uh, good president for the country and for the the opportunity of Christians to keep living for Jesus Christ uh, while we have a chance, while we have time to do so. <laughs> now let's continue here. I want to finish up here. Go, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2 and Ephesians 5. I'll give you two heads up. 2 Timothy 2 and Ephesians 5. And we went down a side road. Let's get back on the main highway here. 2 Timothy 2. And verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Paul writes, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. He says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. What's he going to deny you? Salvation? No, he's going to deny you the right to reign with him in his kingdom. But he can't deny you his salvation because you are part of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 29 and 30. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Notice, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Christ can't deny you his salvation any more than he can chop off his own hand. Because he'd have to do that, symbolically speaking, in order to deny you salvation. And you are said to be part of his body once you've trusted him as your savior. You become you, you are in Christ because he's now in you. And you're united together. Now, let me finish up today with a the rest of Hebrews 3 recounts the same, went to the same material uh, a second time. And then verse 19, so we see then that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And uh, those who don't believe, this is applied, this is going to be a, a applied to Jews, uh, particularly Jews, left after the rapture of the saints. After the church goes up, then the, the age of grace through faith is over and the tribulation begins and now salvation will end up being a combination of maintaining that faith and proving it by your good works. And by the way, not only is salvation easier to receive now, but doing good, good deeds or good works to, to testify of your faith is easier to do now as well. Both of those things. But it won't be that way after the rapture takes place. Um, let me finish up by assaulting one of the modern versions of the Bible. And here in Hebrews 3, notice verses 15, or rather, verses 16 and 17. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? We mentioned that when we were talking about the spies and the Israelites rejecting the spies. Here's the NIV, 1978, the non-inspired version. I told you about a guy 
a, a minister who I encountered during my job, and he said, are you still uh, holding on to the King James Bible? And I said, are you still testing positive for NIV? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like that very well, but he, you know, he had to chuckle. He didn't know what to do. Hebrews 3, uh, verse... Verse uh, 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? No, actually, not all of them did rebel. Some of them didn't rebel, and they followed Caleb and Joshua and went into the Promised Land. So that is historically and factually false. That's factually inaccurate. Not all the Jews did rebel. Some uh, followed Moses and Joshua and were willing to go into Canaan, but, uh, but the multitude uh, had their way and the multitude rebelled. So God said, right, I'm going to wander around for 40 years so all of you complainers are dead and gone. But not everybody that came out of Egypt with Moses rebelled. Some did not. You know, it would have been pretty lonesome for Caleb and Joshua to go into Canaan all by themselves, nobody following them. But there were a lot of people who did not rebel and lived to see the promised land. And uh, God willing, I'm going to preach a sermon, I hope to title, The Best KJV Sermon Ever. And I want to give you some factual mistakes found in the modern Bibles, some scientific mistakes found in the modern Bibles, and uh, read to you scores of, of, of praises for that Bible by some of the most influential people in the last uh, 400 years.